So our next speaker, um, we're going to just give him a little bit more time than we usually have. Um, he is a graduate of Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry in Redding, California. Been there for two years. Uh, he also ha- holds two masters from Biola uh, University. He's actually pretty smart. And he's getting his THD at uh, Global Awakening Theological Seminary. And so he's going to bring it this morning. It's a lot of pressure on you, bro. But would you please help me in welcoming uh, Elijah Stevens? Come on up, Elijah. Man, see, I wish I was as tall as you. I could do that. But Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to show the trailer to the film before we began, if that would be cool. All right. Um, let's do that. Are you guys ready or... Need a second. All right, let me step to the side. The power of God hit me and I was instantly healed. This man's spinal cord had been severed and he was totally healed. To see a little five year old girl that's never heard before when all of a sudden the ears open. That's enough for me. I don't need to see a doctor's report. Jump up, man, stop running. The standardly understood definition of a miracle is an occurrence that has no other good explanation. Many people mistake things that happen entirely by chance as some sort of miracle. I mean, there are hundreds of millions of people who claim to have experienced divine healing. Are you going to dismiss all of that? My passion has been to bridge the gap between the intellectual and the supernatural. I heard all of these testimonies of people having extraordinary miracles. What I wasn't seeing was objective evidence. So I decided to go find it myself. I just speak to all pain in the shoulder in Jesus' name. Is the pain gone? And I say full healing in the name of Jesus. Why do you think the miracles don't happen when the cameras are on? Some testimonies are false. Some testimonies are exaggerated. Miracles don't happen. The moment you investigate them carefully from a scientific perspective, they unravel. Be skeptical. Have you ever seen anything like this? No. Wanting evidence is not a lack of faith. There's power and proof. Two or three miracles are anomalies, but thousands of miracle case studies would change the way we think about the world. So, like I said in the movie, my passion is to meld the intellect in the supernatural, which is odd. Like, no one else does that or wants that uh, in most charismatic circles. There, there's a few of us, but um, I wanna tell you why this means so much to me. Um, grew up in the church, uh, grew up in the Presbyterian church, grandpa and elder. Um, my mom taught Sunday school, taught me to pray. She also beat me for hours at a time. Like, it was super traumatic, blood would just run down my legs. Um, I would shake in the bed, like I couldn't fall asleep. I'd sometimes I'd just pass out with shock. And um, that makes you go, is God real? Is God a fairy tale that you just, you know, make old people feel good about dying? Is that what God is? Um, is, is it the thing that oppressors use to get their way so that they can do bad things in Jesus' name and call it good. At the same time, I I had a radical, powerful encounter with God when I was 12. Um, I started praying. I went to church camp at sixth grade. I prayed, God, if you're real, 
show me in a way that I know that I know. Because, one, I'm into girls, <laughs> right? And my mind's coming up with all types of crazy stuff. And I want to party. I want to live this crazy lifestyle that I see my friends living. Um, but at the same time, I know, knew Jesus, if he existed, like, I would throw my life away. And I needed some type of clarity. So I prayed that prayer. Year goes by, nothing's happened. At the same church camp, seventh grade, I say, God, if you're real, show me in a way that I know that I know. And if I'll read the Bible from beginning to end, and if by the end I don't believe, I'm done. I did not know how thick that book was at the time. <laughs> um, but I, I, I kept my promise but it was super slow, and I remember reading Genesis and Exodus, and I, I'm like, I know these stories from Bible school, and then I got into Le Leviticus, and it's like killing goats. We've never done that at church. Um, but I kept going, and I got to the point where Moses is taken into heaven um, because he's not allowed to go into the promised land. It was an ordinary day, and I hear a little voice in my head. And I would have forgotten this years ago. But this is what the voice said. If you don't give your life to me, you'll miss out on everything I want to offer you. And I would have forgotten it. And so after that, I began to feel the presence of God. And it just felt like he was holy and I am not holy. And it kept increasing. I'm like, uh, is this me or is this something I'm making up? And increasing, I'm like, I don't think I'm making this up. And increasing, and I became terrified because I knew I was before a holy God and I would be judged if I was not right with him and I was not right with him. I started screaming, don't kill me, God. Don't kill me, God. This is too intense. Stop. And it didn't stop and it kept going and it kept going. And I remembered the come to Jesus talks. I heard as a child, the Jesus is the only way to salvation. Give your life to him. And I gave my life to him and I felt peace. Um, and so I, I, I lived the normal Christian lifestyle. Um, growing up, I went to youth group. I learned the Bible. I prayed, went to college, studied philosophy and psychology. I dual, dual majored in them. And I started having really hard questions. Really hard questions. What about evolution? Um, is the Bible historically accurate? Um, was the experience I had as a child merely psychological? How do you tell that from a real divine encounter? Um, and what about other cultures? And so I, I really pressed into the intellectual side and at the same time, the church I grew up in uh, was called a cessationist church. That meant they didn't believe that in any supernatural events today. Uh, they didn't believe in modern healings or prophecy. They thought all of that closed with the Bible. And I found out about the vineyard movement. And I started going to a vineyard church because I wanted to see a miracle for myself. I thought to myself, you know what, if I saw a miracle, it would answer all these hard God questions. And so I went and um, people would pray for me and it would feel like they had like a phone line from heaven. I'm like, how do you know these things about me? Um, are you just really good at guessing things by looking at me oh, you're a guy and you struggle with lust, you're in college, right? Or is it God's talking to them, telling them details about my friend's names? Which is it? Um, while I was in college, um, I thought to myself, this was 2000, uh, I need to pay for college. How do I do that? And I thought, well, the Army Reserve pays for college, and there's, we, we've just had an, a war. There's not going to be another one anytime soon. <laughs> and so I sign up for the Army Reserve, 
go through boot camp after that 9-11, I'm like, oh, that wasn't a good plan. <laughs> uh, I end up graduating college and going to Iraq for a year. And we were on the border of Kuwait and Iraq, and you should not do this if you're in the military. But I was in a guard tower from sunup to sunset by myself, and it was miserable. And so I started sneaking books up into the guard tower, uh, which you shouldn't do. So don't do this. If you're in the military, you will get in trouble. But there was no one around. We were in a, uh, almost the green zone. And so, uh, and they were on Jack Deere, John Wimber on healing miracles. And so I, I read those and I came back and I came to my vineyard church. And I'm like, all right, show me the miracles. I've read about them in all the books. I want you, just go do it. Like make, make someone in a wheelchair walk. I'll watch and then I'll know. They're like, yeah, we've read the books too. We don't really do this stuff. And so I'm like, well, I want to see this. Let me lead a prayer team. Okay. So I started leading the prayer team. We would just go in a room and I would take the stuff I'd read in the books and teach them that. And then I would go, well, let's see if this works. And so I would remember like John Wimber tapes where he's like, have people circle up. And I'm like, okay, well, let's make a circle. <laughs> let's make a circle because the book said to make a circle and dial down and wait for God. And so come Holy Spirit, let's just hold out our hands and wait on the Holy Spirit. And then I realized after I'd prayed that, I don't know what to do if he doesn't show up, right? Because I don't know. And I remember telling myself, I'll give God five minutes. I'll give God five minutes. And I remember that's a long time <laughs> to wait in silence, looking at people and everyone's looking at you and I just remember how much I was sweating and being like, this is a minute and a half. <laughs> and as I'm doing that, um, this guy comes up and he says, I think I got a word of knowledge. And that's just like a picture on the movie screen of your mind. I think I got a word of knowledge. And the word of knowledge was um, this. I saw a lamp fall out of heaven and crash. Follow, saw a surf bar or a board fall out of heaven and crash. I saw a table fall out of heaven and crash. Then he ended that, and I thought, well, now I've got to tell this guy he's wrong. <laughs> like, this means nothing. You're coming up with gibberish, bro. And right as I'm about to say this, this other man raises his hand. He says, that's me. My life's falling apart. And I thought, well, let's take the attention off of me. <laughs> and what I'll do is I'll have this guy who got the word of knowledge uh, go pray for this other guy. And we're all people who hadn't seen miracles or anything like this. And so he goes over to the guy who said, this is my life, and he puts his hand on him, and the guy starts shaking and falls down. And I thought, whoa, God's here. God's here. And so that kind of launched me in a career of pursuing the supernatural. I started making space in my life to go after the things of God. But I made a major mistake. I got into it. I was praying for the sick. I was radical, but I shut my brain off a little. Have you ever done that? Have you ever said, all right, I want to see God move, so I'm just going to stop asking questions? I had another friend. His name was Bucky. He was my senior pastor at the time, 
And he did the same thing. And I, I, I saw super powerful testimonies. Um, so demons coming out of people. I remember one time um, I went to a conference and there was this girl. She just had her leg wrapped. Uh, she had broken it at volleyball practice. And she was going to get a cast the next day. And we prayed for her. She got completely healed. Um, didn't have a broken foot anymore. Saw crazy stuff. And then I had a dream. And in the dream, it's this. It's Bill Johnson saying to me, Elijah, what do you want to do with your life? And I say, plant churches that see signs and wonders. He says, come to California. And so that's what led me and Allison out to California. And we started going to the BSSM uh, School of Supernatural Ministry. But my friend Bucky left the faith, said there's no God. There's no evidence for miracles. Um, because he had started reading books by Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens at the time who were a lot bigger than they are today. And that told me there's something not right about shutting your mind off. That if Christianity works, it's got to be true. It can't just be powerful um, it's got to be real. And uh, you know who agrees with me? Jesus. <laughs> you don't have to. There's a lot of charismatics that don't, but Jesus does. Because he says this, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know what he says the greatest commandment is? To love the Lord your God with all your heart your soul, and your emotions or mind. He says that's greater than loving other people. That's the second greatest. Here's why. Because if you don't learn to love God with all your mind, you're going to harm a lot of people. Because you're going to believe something crazy about faith and then not take your kid to the doctor. And I've met those people. When I was doing the film, I, I went up to Oregon and there was a cult of people who did not do medicine. Um, so you, I would see these old women walking out with goiters, kids that had died from diabetes. Um, and so we have got to learn how to meld together the intellectual and the supernatural. And here's the deal. Christianity started out with the two together. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of church history that'll get you pumped. Um, the first thing you need to know, after the apostles die, 100 AD, we saw, see the rise of a group of people called the apologists. And what an apologist is, is it's someone who's really good at telling people about Jesus in an intellectual way. And so we have letters from these apologists written to the emperors of Rome, debunking every one of their gods. Also, those apologists went into temples and cast out demons. That's how Christianity spread. It didn't spread through healing as much through exorcism uh, at first. After that, um, Christianity was heavily persecuted, but they loved people so well that in the 300s, they, it became legal. In the 380s, it became the official religion of Rome because what happened was Christianity brought an intellectual revival that answered the questions of the Greek philosophers. How do you live a good life? 
That's what Socrates was asking. And Christianity birthed the first hospitals because our Lord and Savior said something no one else had ever said. He told a parable about someone who goes and stops for a poor sick person and pays their bills. And that caught on of that's how we live. We take care of the poor. And that just wasn't a value back then. We take care of the sick. They're not worthless. After that, the monks uh, in, in about the 400s, when the barbarians come and sack Rome, they keep the Greek and Roman literature and they keep writing it. That's why we have logic today. Um, the church integrated Greco-Roman logic into defending the faith. Um, that's why we have the great works of the Iliad. Um, it's because the church said, we need to preserve all of culture. Fast forward, um, the church plants the first universities. You may have heard of some Christian universities, Oxford, Princeton, Harvard, Yale. All of these were dedicated to the glory of God. We birth science. Francis Bacon, the father of the scientific method, Christian. Copernicus uh, showed that the uh, earth went around the sun. Christian, Galileo, Christian, Newton, Christian. Why? Because our Lord and Savior said the truth will set you free and you don't have to fear what other people tell you because Jesus is alive. I can say the truth in, when people disagree with me. We transform the world because we were intellectual people who grounded in the word of God. And the brightest minds in church history did deep theology, Thomas Aquinas, deep theology, and had powerful encounters. He had such powerful encounters near the end of his life that he says, everything I've written about God is straw compared to the real thing. And he's not saying, throw out your intellect. He's saying, let your intellect point you to Yahweh. Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was a man, he would go out and preach in the fields during the Great Awakenings. And people would climb up in trees to see him. And he would have to say, get down out of the trees because the power of God's gonna come and it might shake you down. That Jonathan Edwards was the third president of Princeton. And then the second Great Awakening comes along and people went, you know what? Let's just make it about the emotions. Let's just do, tell them how to get saved and things will be fine. And that's when we begin to see the splinter between the intellect and the supernatural. And my heart's to bring them back together. In the 70s and 80s, there was this splinter in the church between scripture and the emotional. We didn't talk about emotions or relationships. And now it's time to turn the volume back up because we live in a culture where people have an internet. We live in a post-truth culture. We live in a post-Christian culture. And so we've got to take the hardest questions we can and ask God, Help us communicate this to people who struggle with this. And so when I was in first year of BSSM I, and Bucky had left his faith, I prayed this prayer. God, make me a catalyst for the next great awakening. I want a strategy. And so what he put in my heart at the time was make a documentary about miracles with medical evidence. Well, why? Because I think if you want to tell intellectuals miracles are true, 
you got to be able to show them that there's a before thing and an after thing, and here's all the naturalistic explanations, and those can't explain this. So I pray, I felt that in my heart, and I started, kind of started uh, going after it in that I asked people for testimonies, but it really went no, nowhere. And in my third year of BSSM, um, I, I give up whatever this was. I'm just like, maybe that's me. Maybe I ate tacos and felt that God's <laughs> inspiring me to do this. And I'm at my house on a, I want to say a Tuesday. Could have been another day. And I get a text from someone at second year BSSM. Not, not even in second year. Um, Sean Bowles calls your name out at church. I thought, maybe, maybe there's another Elijah. And then someone else texts me. He called out Elijah and Allison. And so I drive to the church. And I drive so fast that um, I was kind of going below that place. If you got a ticket, you would go to jail. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you're like, I want to get there fast, but not go to jail. Um, get there, and he tells me my name, my birth date, my wife's name. She's an occupational therapist um, that, uh, and, and as he's doing this, I'm thinking, these are too accurate. This feels like, eh, facebook -y. And then I'm like, God, you're going to have to tell me things not in that. And so he starts telling me about Allison's aunts and how Aunt Karen has a daughter named Silky. And I feel the presence of God just like I'm bending over and just shaking under the power and I'm not that guy. And so I'm like, okay, God, I'm in. And so I talked to Randy Clark um, he started an organization called the Global Medical Research Institute, and its goal is to research miracles, and Paul helped birth that. And I'm like, I don't know what to do next. I've never turned a camera on. Never turned a camera on, God. Um, you want to give me some miracle knowledge about how to do camera work? And he didn't. Uh, and so I filmed a lot of bad film, um, but I keep going on this journey with the Lord and, um, cases start coming in, but it's a seven year journey that I thought would be done in a year. And we raised about $135,000 from Kickstarter. And I thought that would be enough but sometimes you have to sacrifice everything. And so I watched in tears as my wife pulled her retirement out to finish this. But you get one life and God's worthy of your worship. He's worthy of your land, of your finance, of everything. Because one day, a hundred billion years from now, when you're seeing before Christ his glories and you see the raw power of God day in and day out, every sacrifice you have ever made will seem trivial. Trivial. And, and he is worth it. And you know what the trade-off you get for sacrificing everything is? God. A lot of us talk about grace and grace is a gift. Well, what's the gift? It's God himself. And if you want God, he'll give himself to you. And he's looking for a people who will go, I want you to love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, everything. Give it to me. And I know what it's like to be someone who's deeply intellectual and have lots of questions. And I think that's good. I think 
sometimes in church world, we just kind of go, well, have a little faith. When you should go, take your questions and research them. Write them all down. And there's Christians out there who have worked through all of them. Just do Google your correct question. Why does God allow evil? What about, you know, is there evidence for the ev- exodus? Whatever. Did Jesus really rise? And then put the word apologetics in. And there's someone that's written a book or done a YouTube video. You need to answer your questions. Also, you need to learn to doubt things. You should doubt the devil. You should doubt used car salesmen, (laughs) right? Like, don't be naive. But I'm also saying this, you should look really hard at the evidence for the resurrection. You should look really hard at the evidence for uh, miracles. Every miracle in this film has been published in a peer-reviewed medical journal. That is... The best medical professionals in the world wrote up a paper. They researched all the journals on that issue of does anything go into spontaneous remission or not on this. They concluded no. They looked at every naturalistic explanation and go, there's no naturalistic explanation here. And their peers who are not Christians go, we can't find one either. That's something to think about. Because I believe if you go on an intellectual journey with God, you'll find him. Because God is real. And and you keep bumping into reality. We keep bumping into reality. And so don't be afraid of that. But I would also say one of the things about being a deep thinker that you need to deal with in yourself is there's a difference between reading books and getting objective knowledge and then getting experiential knowledge. And the whole purpose of scripture is to go, here's the objective knowledge you have that you'll need in order to get experiential knowledge. But they're different skills. Being good at research being good at reading, uh, forming logical conclusions and, you know, working through different opinions is not the same skill set that it takes to put yourself in positions to see God move. Putting yourself in positions to see God move sometimes requires um, going out and taking risk. And one of the hardest things for me was because I grew up in so much abuse was to start taking risk again because it's not safe. You don't know the outcomes. And sometimes we overemphasize our intellect at the expense of doing the things God told us to do in Scripture. But I'll tell you this. While I encourage you, read every book you can. Love God with all your mind. You gotta love him with all your soul. And that requires putting yourself on the line. I remember the first healing, uh, some of the first healings I ever saw and how terrified I was before I prayed for people and how much joy I felt in my heart afterwards. I'm going to tell you a story about something similar to that. One day, I had a friend, two friends, in Bethel, and um, I wanted to go see miracles. You know, maybe God could do miracles. And so we were going to do something called power evangelism. That's where you share about Jesus and you pray for people. And so what we decided to do was to go feed migrant workers and give them blankets. There's a lot of migrant workers in Northern California because there's a lot of orchards. And so as we're driving, I turned to my friend in the back, and her name's Christina, and I said, have you ever seen a miracle? And she said, yeah. One time I prayed for a man. Uh, He had a bone-on-bone knee injury, 
we prayed seven times and he was healed on the seventh. And that jogged my memory of something that had happened earlier that week. There was this guy named Dave at church and he had a bone on bone knee injury and I had prayed for him. He had been in a motorcycle 30 years earlier and he walked like this because bone on bone knee injury means there's no cartilage and he's just in tons of pain. And I prayed for him and nothing happened. But I knew Dave would be at Sunday school again. And so I thought to myself, if, I, if and when I ever see Dave again, I'll tell him that testimony. And as we're driving down the road, I see Dave pass us. And there's this moment where I go, I'll see him at church again. But I'm like, I want to see if this is God. And so my, I tell my friend, turn the car around. And he turns the car around. And we flag him down into this lumberyard parking lot. And I get out and I go and I tell him the testimony that I'd heard. And I prayed the quick little, God, please heal this man prayer. I'm like, Dave, can you test this out? And this is a guy that walks like this on this knee because it's hurting so bad. And he does this. And then he falls to the ground and he starts crying. And I think, oh no, God, I've broken him. And then he gets up and he runs off and he doesn't come back. <laughs> like I'm standing there 10 minutes and this guy doesn't come back. And I'm like, I've never had that one happen before. Um, but there was a lady with him. I said, why do you think he got up and ran off? She said, he hadn't ran in 30 years. And so we get back in the car and we're driving up the interstate and I see this man and it's like this, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, running up the road. And God is looking for people who will put themselves out there and go and pray for the days. And that can be you, He's such a good God. He always puts the cookies on the bottom shelf. He does. And he takes broken, abused people like myself who will go, I'll step one inch out of my comfort zone. That's where the kingdom of God is. It's at hand. It takes, it's not here, it's here. And if you will stretch yourself, I'm not saying Go to Africa and lay your life down in the dirt with Heidi Baker. I am saying one inch consistently. You'll see the power of God so much, you're like, I'm not afraid of Africa. I'm not afraid to die. You know what one of my favorite quotes from church history is? I think it was Irenaeus, and he was discipled by the apostles. And he's talking about them and, and, and about the resurrection. And he says, when, he, when they stuck their hand in the side of Jesus, they stopped fearing evil and death. And I am praying for radical God encounters for you that will so transform your life that you no longer fear the consequences of evil or death because you know you can take my body but I'll be resurrected you can put me in jail but not prison because I'm free and I am praying for you that you will know the power of God in a radical way but it takes your whole self so stop shutting your brains off but also Stop living in fear. Stop living in fear. Become a whole person. That is the promise of the gospel. 
everything gets made new. Everything gets made new. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. Do it, yes. So let's just stand. I don't know what's going to happen, um, but I'm just going to ask for God's presence. Do we have a prayer team? Well, let's get those people doing whatever they do. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you. I'm just going to give him a moment. And we pray for fresh encounters with you. And I feel him like fire in my chest. So just hold out your hands like you're about to receive a present. We pray for fresh encounter, God. There's nothing I can do to make anything happen. There's nothing... I as a person can do, you can. And so move through this room, God. Begin touching people with your anointing, with your presence. We pray for fresh baptism, fresh fillings of your spirit, God that embolden people to go beyond where they felt comfortable before. And it feels just like a fire in me melted with joy and love. It's like the tangible presence of God. I feel tingling increasing in my hands and a weight. And if you feel the Holy Spirit moving on you today, we would love to partner and bless what he's doing. And so we wanna invite you to come up front and get prayer. Thank you. Is there anyone else that just feels like God is doing something in me? Like let's, let's make room for where God's working. We wanna find out what the Father is doing and join him. Fresh encounter, God. Just come up and get prayer from any of our prayer team members. There's some free down here. And I want to pray for those. Raise your hand if you're a deep thinker. Raise your hand if you wrestle with hard questions about Christianity and God. I pray for mentors for your life. I pray that God will satisfy you. Guys, I worked through the resurrection of Jesus. I read Bart Ehrman, John Cross, and everyone you can think of, and I am so convinced Jesus is alive. And I pray that you have that, that confidence that I... I know because I went down the rabbit hole. I bless you. I bless your mind. There's been so many word curses spoken over spark people. They said you're a doubter. You felt isolated. I pray isolated no more and that God would raise teachers up out of this that would be able to transform and give to the next generation give to the next generation what you never got. Okay, while we um, minister to people who are wanting prayer, let me just bless you guys. God, I just thank you for what you're doing this morning. God, I thank you for the word. God, I thank you for your resurrection power. God, and I thank you for the testimonies that are going to come out of Monday night at UNM. And so, Lord, we just bless the people.
here today. God, I pray that they have an amazing week, that they would feel your peace, your joy, your love, and be able to carry it all throughout New Mexico and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Uh, we'll be here next week again. Uh, again, I just want to invite you to a newcomer's lunch. If you need to know where the address for that is, it'll be at the welcome table, or you could go online and look it up under our events, and then scroll all the way down to the newcomer's lunch. It's uh, only 10 minutes away. Um, bless you, and we'll see you uh, hopefully after church or tomorrow night. See you.